in the famous hollywood movie limitless a pharmaceutical company invents a drug which when taken increases intelligence so whoever takes the drug becomes hyper intelligent they are able to memorize entire books just by looking at them they are able to learn musical instruments and new languages overnight it basically turns them into learning machines now the question i want to put to you today the question which i want to investigate is to what extent in real life can your brain be hacked to what extent are the cognitive abilities of a person enhanceable are you in fact limitless now this is a very important question for you as upsc aspirants because you will be forced to increase your cognitive abilities to enhance them to push your limits to meet the requirements of the examination like i've mentioned before the examination is not as difficult as it is different nothing prepares us for this examination no school or college education does so because the subject matter of this examination is not an academic discipline the subject matter of this examination is life itself it is what is happening in the world now what is affecting people now that is being asked in this examination in various formats if you look at previous year questions from the prelims or mains even if uh, you look at the prelims from this year just asked a few a few days ago you'll find questions of very application based practical incisive so a person who was answering them would have to have a very good basic understanding of the broad patterns that were going on in the uh, economic sphere of the country in the social sphere uh, other places in, including the environmental issues that the country is facing or the world is facing and so on so they were all very practical and real application based questions nobody was worried about how well you can code or how much uh, detailed professional knowledge you have about chemistry the subject matter of this examination is the world itself and the world itself is dynamic it changes right do you know what else changes your brain changes your brain is a highly adaptive organ it has been built and designed by evolution for one purpose and that purpose is adaptation adaptation to a changing environment it is a staggeringly complicated and powerful organ in fact every student who has ever been called an average student is somebody who has not learned to tap into the potential of this amazing organ and what i want to tell you today is that i have been fascinated with this idea for quite a number of years psychology was my optional subject i continue reading it uh, researching about it i completed a masters in it i keep researching about it and i stay up to date with the uh, happenings in the sphere of cognitive science which includes neuroscience psychology and many other sub disciplines so there have been a lot of insights which have been gleaned which have been understood from research in cognitive sciences now these researchers these scientists are interested in how the brain learns and what happens when learning becomes faulty and what happens when learning becomes supercharged right so there has been a lot of insight about this and i have tried to take all of those insights all of those insights in my own experience and from research and i have embedded them into a study methodology which i want to tell you about this is exactly how you use the inherent potential powers of your own mind to enhance and optimize the efficiency for upsc preparation in particular it is called the hexa task method now as the name suggests hexa task means six tasks hex stands for six the hexa task method is a series of six steps which i will tell you about in detail which you must follow if you want to optimize your learning efficiency and if you want to increase it by at least 150% is this methodology if used properly will lead to drastic drastic improvements in the amount that you are able to synthesize in the amount you are able to remember in the amount you are able to focus on retain and understand it will have a ripple effect on everything else including other areas of your preparation so listen carefully to what these six steps are and listen carefully to how best to deploy them the first step let me first give you a walk through about how this thing works the hexa task method is a series of six steps like i told you they are part of the strategizer which itself is a part of the ultimate upsc navigator which i will tell you about later it will only be given to a few students but i will give you a, a, an overview about it the hexa task method is a b12qrt essentially 
big picture formation, first reading, second reading, analyze, PYQs, revision, and testing. I'll tell you exactly what these are and how they work. But first, let me tell you what it actually means and how best to use it. People come to me and many students ask me the question that they have done something. They have done history, for instance, or they've done polity. Now, I'm not exactly sure what they mean when they say that they've done history or polity. Most of them mean that I have read Lakshmi Kant. Most of them mean that I've read Bipin Chandra. But this is does not equate to them having done the subject because the UPSC examination is not about your knowledge of Lakshmi Kant. It's not about your knowledge of Bipin Chandra. They might ask questions from them because they are authoritative sources, but that's about it. What they're interested in is in your knowledge, the knowledge that you've gained from the book and from other places to gain a holistic understanding of the entire subject. That is the subject matter. So the books themselves are not enough, right? So when you say you've done a subject, when you've prepared for it, for the UPSC examination, you need to do six steps to claim that you have actually done it. Take, for instance, history. If you claim you've done history, it is not enough to say that you've read a book. You would have to have done the big picture formation for it. You would have to have done the first reading, the second reading. You would have to have analyzed previous year questions about it, revision, testing, and evaluation. Now, these steps are very important and detailed steps. I'll get to them uh, in detail, starting with the first one. Big picture formation. This is my absolute favorite and it will also, I hope, be your absolute favorite because this is where you fall in love with the subject. This is where you develop genuine curiosity about the subject. Big picture formation is nothing but you exploring the subject from the point of view of a hobbyist. You know who has genuine interest in a subject, in a thing, in anything? A hobbyist. A person who has a hobby or a passion for something will go into more detail, will spend more time, will invest more energy and will know a lot more about that subject than perhaps even an expert. You need to become a hobbyist or an interested person in a variety of different subjects, right? But we obviously don't have the time to invest in the hobby. So we need to do what hobbyists do. We need to take a page from their book. And this is supported again by research from cognitive science. It is massive. Uh, support by research which says that the deeper the encoding the better the learning and the way to do deeper encoding is to build a foundation a conceptual foundation now in big picture formation what you do is you do not read a book you do not start with books you start with documentaries you start with visuals you start with a big picture overview of the subject you ask yourself the question say for instance for history what makes this subject fascinating to a person who has a hobby in it what is cool about it what is awesome about it what is amazing about it what will make me excited about it and let me tell you a textbook won't do that and that is why most people fall on the wayside and they can never get the level of maturity that is required because they can never arouse the level of interest that is required because they never build the foundations that are required big picture formation is designed to do exactly that. At this stage, we do not worry about memorization. We don't worry about facts. We don't worry about books. We are only exploring as if we had seen the subject for, a, for the first time. All you want is a bird's eye view of it all and to enjoy it. You do this by watching documentaries, by watching videos, and I'll be giving you very detailed playlists of the subjects and how to do picture, big picture formation, but that will come later. It will be given to a few people, not all. We'll talk about that later. But for now, the big picture formation is where you lay the groundwork of your core conceptual foundations for the UPSC examination. And it is on this structure that you overlay facts and more details in the advanced stages of preparation. Coming to the next step in the HexaTask method, it's called first reading. It sounds cliched enough, simple enough, but it is something very particular. What I mean by first reading is that you are familiarizing yourself, you are mapping the book and you are absorbing it. This is where books have entered the picture, but they have only just entered. You do not require, you are not required to read the whole book in detail. You are not required to know every factoid in it. You are not required to know every little detail in it. All you are doing is going through the book and understanding where everything is located. Look at the index of the book carefully and guess what the chapters might be about. Play a guessing game with yourself. Look at the index. You've already done big picture formation, say, for history. 
And if you look at the index and the table of contents, you should be able to correlate with all the visual images in your mind about what must have happened and why this chapter is there and what you can expect from it. So you start to have a dialogue with the text before you start to read it. By scanning the book, you use the visuals and the images which you have acquired in the big picture formation to develop a holistic expectation of the subject matter. So while undertaking the first reading, you need to pay special attention to the headings, to the subheadings. You, you pay special attention to the broad message of the text. You see how the textbook is organized. Is it organized according to chapters of the constitution like Lakshmi Kant or is it organized according to various movements and is every chapter organized according to socio-cultural, agricultural, socio-economic uh, socio uh, cultural reforms and so on like history books. You note all these things. You do not form judgments about the subject. You form judgment about the subject from big picture formation and from what you found interesting and from what is considered to be amazing and cool about the subject. So if you found something interesting in this cursory reading, this is supposed to be a very cursory reading. It is not supposed to be a very detailed reading. You personalize it with your markings. You don't try to create detailed notes at this stage. Note making does not enter at this stage. You just get accustomed to the books, get accustomed to the contents, see how they are scattered about in the book. You try to grasp the narrative in more detail and you take a mental picture of the textbook while you connect with the fascinating facets which you have discovered. This is an example of my own book in which I have done first reading at the stage of first reading you know uh, just by looking at it that I have not gone into a lot of detail. I have added some symbolic markings to remind me that there is something important here and I have done some light underlining for prompting me. Now, why I have done this because a book is usually voluminous and if I'm revising it, I don't want to reread the whole thing. I want to leave breadcrumbs for me to follow the trail. I want to be able to look at a page and see exactly where the important stuff is at first glance. I don't want to spend time reading the whole thing again, because if I'm going to understand that whole thing again, I have to read the previous chapter again. And so it's no use having to read the whole thing again. The first reading is me marking the breadcrumbs. If this is important, this appears to be important. This appears to be interesting, I'll mark it and so on. The entire book is scanned and it is then left. It is after this that we go into the second reading and here things start to get more detailed and interesting. Now a good analogy between the <clears throat> first reading uh, and the second reading is that of a building which is being built. A big picture formation and first reading is you laying the foundations. You've laid the foundations, you've laid the entire structure but you do not yet know the details of the subject, which is fine. So a person at the stage of first reading will probably not be able to answer some questions in the UPSC examination when they look at previous year questions and that is absolutely fine. The reason most people, many of my students ask me, uh, when they ask me that they don't understand something or they're not able to score well is because they are stuck at the level of first reading. They haven't gone deeper and they expect to learn from first reading, what a person can only get from the second reading and later stages. They expect from one reading to be able to answer the questions which the UPSC asks, but this is just practically not possible. There is a way to do it and this is the best possible way because it has been codified from research like I mentioned before. Right? What happens in the second reading exactly? Here you get into more details. You at this stage can make handwritten notes. Now there are two ways to make handwritten notes. You can make them in a separate notebook or you can make them on the book itself. It depends on the uh, type of text you are reading and the volume of difficulty of that text. I have done both. They both work. But in the UPSC examination where the quantum of detail is a lot higher, you should make probably uh, notes which are separate on a separate one. I'll tell you exactly about those things that requires and deserves a separate video and it's a very important topic it's in, in its own right but for now understand the stage of second reading is where note making happens it doesn't happen in the first stage and the idea of making these notes should be to condense these notes you've read the whole book right you've read the book you've now you now need to capture and condense all the information in as little space in as less space as possible so that while revising things become very easy for you and i'll show you an example of it from my own notes you note down any connections which strike your mind of the text that you're reading with other disciplines, with current events or with anything else you think about which is worth remembering. Now in second reading, I am looking at details. I am looking at what happened in the revolt of 1857. I am looking at the names 
which are occurring there. I am looking at the centers of the revolt and I am paying attention to detail. I have already done first reading in which I have a broad overview that the revolt happened and it was an important event because it led to many changes and it really shook the British and so on and so forth. We came close to winning that battle, but not quite. So it was a very important thing to happen. Right? I understand the broad importance of it. I understand the significance of it, the valor of it, the dignity of the people who fought and died in it. I appreciate it, but I don't know much more than that. That I get to know in the second reading. In the first, in the in big picture formation, I formed a basic understanding of it. I looked at some documentaries. I saw, I got interested in it. I got curious in it. I understood. I even uh, got introduced to some important characters in the revolt and so on. So just taking an example to illustrate how the progression of learning in the sequence goes and how will you go through these stages, the level of learning becomes deeper and deeper and deeper and not only are the conceptual foundations laid, but the memory and the facts of the information will inevitably get stored because you're doing so much of the repetition, which is essential to memory, which is again something which research from cognitive science is saying. Repetition is important. Repetition is important for memory. There is, there is no escape from it. You must do it, but you must do it in an effective way. Right. So what exactly is highlighting in note making? You highlight in the second reading, you highlight portions of the text which are part of the conversation. Your notes are supposed to be detailed transcripts of that conversation that you are having with the book. Now, here's an example of me having a conversation with a book of mine. Uh, this is the same book I showed you uh, a while ago in which I have gone into some details. And this is what a second reading looks like. I have uh, highlighted overlaid on top of my first reading some important things. You can see that I have thought about it. I have tried to connect it with what I already knew. I tried to connect it with other disciplines. I am having a dialogue with it. I am trying to synthesize and I am trying to condense everything that I've learned about this topic, whatever is being spoken about in as little words as possible. I'm trying to make flow charts so that when I read it again, everything comes flooding back to me, right? I am already thinking about my experience while revising this. If this is something that they're going to ask me in the examination, and this is my second reading of it, I should have all the details captured and I want to be prepared for what's going to come next, which is revision, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But before that, I must tell you about the fourth stage. So we have done B, one, two. B was big picture formation. One was first reading, two was second reading. A B, one, two, Q. Q stands for analyze PYQs, a very, very important stage and a very misunderstood stage in the progression of UPSC preparation. Now, what is analyzed PYQs? It is not as simple as it may sound. Unfortunately, you can't just open previous year questions. Take a look at these questions, for instance. This year's prelims just asked a few days ago. I took a page at random. And uh, here you have questions about money multiplier. You have questions about uh, investments in India, about water credit. You have questions about inflation. Right. The idea of reading this paper, the idea of understanding it is not to judge if you know what money multiplier is or not. The idea is also not to understand if you know what is water credit or not. The idea is to understand why these questions are coming and where they're coming from so that all questions of these categories, these types can be answered by you. Once you understand why water credit is being asked, you will understand what other things similar to that issue can be asked? Why is money multiplier being asked? It is because it forms the, uh, it's a very fundamental idea in macroeconomics. It is the way an economic and economic functions, and it is closely associated with the monetary policy. These are some things which you can gain from big picture formation from first reading of a subject, but it does not work unless a solid conceptual foundation has been laid, right? So I was telling you about previous year questions and how to analyze them. Now, there's a lot that goes inside it. There's a lot that goes into it. How to get the most out of understanding these previous year questions. You're not doing previous year questions to test yourself or your level of knowledge because you obviously do not have the level of knowledge yet. If you had it, you would have cleared prelims. But if you are in that process, in that process of learning, then a previous year question paper is not something to test you. It is something to tell you what you need to do to, to answer all questions of these types. And a very useful tool I have created to that effect is called the PYQ Analyzer. 
the PYQ analyzer has not been released yet. It will be released and it will be made available to my students who can then go over it and use it. So we've done Q, right? That is the fourth stage. We come to the fifth, the fifth task in the extra task method. The fifth task is R, revision. This is where you use the notes that you have prepared and you, are, you have condensed them to a degree that you can grasp them at a glance, right? This is a, uh, this is, these are my notes from philosophy, uh, optional subject, which I made a few years ago. Well, I was a UPSC aspirant, just like you. And you see this uh, flow chart on top and all of these markings that you see. Now I want to pinpoint two things and the reason that I'm showing this to you. Number one, notice that I am using one page to write uh, on two columns. Why? Because I want my revision to be as fast as possible so that I can do multiple revisions. I want to look at a page and I want to grasp as much information as I possibly can on at one glance. I don't want to keep flipping pages because it gets overwhelming. My concentration will break. I want to look at the page. I want to understand exactly what's written on it. I want it to trigger the memories of what I have read before. That is why I have made that flow chart there. That flow chart basically synthesizes and organizes the entire chapter that I wanted to read. In this case, it was Buddhism. And those notes are my notes about how it connects to other things, right? Revision. These are, by the way, these are the types of notes you should create in second reading stage. In revision, you keep redoing them. You form or make these diagrams, but you don't make notes in revision. You don't read the whole textbook, more importantly, while doing revision. If you have done first reading, second reading properly, you will not need to read the whole textbook again. You will have marked it efficiently, intelligently. You will have written your side notes. You will have made connections with current affairs and you will look at it and you will be able to assemble it all of it very quickly so that you can go over all of these different areas and all of these different topics. You should be honest and ask yourself if you have given the prelims, if you have ever been able to complete the syllabus. Nobody ever completes the syllabus for the UPSC because it is just so vast, because there are just so many sources to condense and to understand. The only way to do so is to go through these stages so that every time you read it, every stage you go through, whether that's big picture formation or first reading or second reading or analyzing previous year questions, is adding something which will be required exactly at the time of the examination, right? And that is why these are arranged in this sequence and that's why they work. The last stage is testing. Now testing, again, people assume is something that they must do. But the, the purpose of testing is a little different. The purpose of testing is you putting yourself in the shoes of the test taker and simulating the experience. This is a flight simulator, flight simulator, which I'm showing you. The, the, the person who uses, uh, the, who's using it is not actually in an airplane, but for all intents and purposes, the entire experience is simulated. So they know what it feels like. They can get an actual experience. They can overcome the anxiety. They can get actual muscle memory of that experience, right? Testing is used for that. It is also used for feedback. And there are there, there is a detailed uh, list of stipulations which I have recommended and when testing should enter the picture, how much testing is required and so on, which I will share with you in the lesson that I have given. So these are the stages of the hexatask method, the most powerful method which captures the essence of insights from the psychology of learning has been embedded and placed in a sequence. And the entire UPSC syllabus has been used, placed in a sequence so that now when you prepare, it is not a matter of you reading a bunch of books. It's about you going through a series of steps so that your brain understands the topic regardless of the book that you read, right? This is a different way of doing things. This is a new way of doing things, which is why you need to be well versed with what you're doing. I have created a test which you must take. It is called the Hexatask Qualification Test. If you are going to use the Hexatask method effectively, you will need to qualify this test. The minimum passing percentage is 50%. If you score 50% and above, then in my books, you are qualified to use the extra task method in your preparation and you should begin using it in earnest because it will change the entire game. Like I mentioned earlier, the all of this forms part of the ultimate UPSC navigator, which will be coming soon, which I'll be telling you about uh, soon enough. But for now, I will leave you with this message, with this video. 
and uh, with a few links that I am leaving below to you for you to go through and for you to uh, understand until my next task appears and we will be going into the details of your strategy and how to use the hexatask method, how to use everything that we have spoken about so far, how to use the insights from goal setting theory, how to strategize effectively and how to make the perfect, absolute perfect strategy for you. That will be coming next. But for now, you need to go through the lesson of the hexatask, which I have mentioned. You need to review what you've been doing, what you've been doing wrong, where among these hexatask, B12, QRT, were you not proficient enough or you did not think about and you need to fix those areas. You need to take the hexatask qualification test to understand this and to solidify it. And then very soon, we will put all of this into practice.